This is Space Time Series 25, Episode 8. Coming up on Space Time. Making stars out of bubbles. A new model to explain the lunar dichotomy. Why the two sides of the moon look so different. And Beijing says China's new space station will be completed this year. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study has found that the local bubble, a region of the galaxy through which the Sun, Earth and Solar System are currently travelling, may have triggered the birth of thousands of new stars. A report in the journal Nature shows how young stars in star-forming regions within 500 light-years of the Earth appear to be sitting on the surface of this expanding bubble, which was generated by a series of exploding stars or supernovae. The local bubble is a relative cavity in the interstellar medium in the Orion arm of the Milky Way galaxy. It contains our closest celestial neighbours, including the local interstellar cloud, which contains the solar system, the neighbouring G cloud, the Ursa Major moving stellar group, and the Hades open cluster. Around a thousand light years across, and defined by its neutral hydrogen density of around 0.05 atoms per cubic centimetre, the local bubble has just one-tenth the average density of the Milky Way's interstellar medium, which is 0.5 atoms per cubic centimetre. It's also around a sixth out of the local interstellar cloud in which we're currently sitting, which is around 0.3 atoms per cubic centimetre. While astronomers have known about the local bubble's existence for decades, this new work allows them to see and understand its beginnings and impact on the surrounding interstellar gas. The study's lead author, Catherine Zucker from the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, says her research reconstructs the evolutionary history of the local galactic neighborhood and shows how a chain of events beginning 14 million years ago led to the creation of a vast bubble that's responsible for the formation of all nearby young stars. The data shows how blast waves from these supernovae pushed the interstellar gas outwards, creating the bubble-like structure, with the build-up of material along the bubble's edge triggering starburst, that is, the birth of new stars. Today, seven well-known star-forming regions or molecular clouds, that is, dense regions in space where stars can form, are sitting on the surface of the bubble. Zucker says her calculations suggest around 15 supernovae have gone off over millions of years in order to form the local bubble as it is today. And this oddly shaped bubble isn't dormant, but continues to slowly grow and expand at a rate of around 6 kilometers per second. However, Zucker says it's pretty well lost most of its oomph now and has pretty much plateaued out in terms of speed. The expansion speed of the bubble, as well as the past and present trajectories of the young stars forming on its surface, were all derived using data obtained from the European Space Agency's Gaia Observatory. When the first supernovae that created the local bubble ignited, the Sun, Earth and Solar System were still far away. We only entered the bubble about 5 million years ago as we continue on our orbit around the Milky Way's galactic centre. But right now, the Sun, Earth and Solar System are almost directly in the bubble's centre. So today, as humans peer out into space from near the Sun, we have a front row seat to the process of star formation occurring all around us on the bubble's surface. Astronomers first theorised that superbubbles would have been pervasive through the Milky Way around 50 years ago, and the new data provides proof of that. After all, what are the chances that we'd be smack bang in the middle of one of these things if there weren't lots of them around? This report from the Space Telescope Science Institute and the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Where did we come from? Not humans, but the Sun and nearby stars. How did our galactic neighborhood come to look the way it does? New research reveals that 14 million years ago, powerful supernova started exploding, blowing out a bubble of hot gas called the local bubble. As millennia passed, the bubble expanded, sweeping up clouds of interstellar gas and dust on its surface. Over time, these clouds collapsed to form thousands of new stars. Our sun was far away when the bubble first started forming. But about five million years ago, 
the sun's path through the galaxy took it into the bubble. Looking out from inside the 1,000 light year wide bubble today, we see star formation all around us. Stars are forming on the bubble's surface, but amazingly, not inside it. This discovery supports a 50-year-old theory that supernova bubbles from dying stars can sweep up gas that gives birth to new stars, and leads astronomers to wonder how bubbly the rest of the galaxy may be. This is space time, still to come. A new model to explain the lunar dichotomy, why the two halves of the moon look so different. And Beijing says China's new space station will be completed this year. All that and more still to come on Space Time. A new study supports the idea that a massive cosmic impact billions of years ago could account for the vast differences between the near and far sides of the Moon. Known as the lunar dichotomy, the difference between the Moon's near and far sides has fascinated scientists ever since the first images of the far side of the Moon were captured, showing that it's vastly different from the near side of the Moon, the one which always faces the Earth. The near side is dominated by vast plains of solidified magma, while the far side features a far thicker crust, at least 20 kilometres thicker, and it's covered with many smaller craters. The new study, reported in the journal Nature Geoscience, describes a new model which tries to explain this lunar asymmetry. Astronomers generally agree that the Moon was formed 4.5 billion years ago, when the Mars-sized planet, which astronomers call Thea, collided with the early proto-Earth, turning both bodies into a magma ocean. While most of the molten material accreted onto the Earth, some ejecta was flung into orbit around the Earth and eventually coalesced to form the Moon. Now, this should have resulted in a uniformly differentiated structure with a symmetrical crust, mantle and core. Yet for some reason, the crust on the lunar far side is at least 20 kilometres thicker than that on the near side. Something must have happened after the Moon formed to change things. Now, previous studies have all focused on the giant Aitken Basin, a massive impact crater at the Moon's south pole, which was produced some 4 billion years ago. And this is where the new study's ideas come in. It hypothesizes that the impact created gravitational instability and enough heat to trigger colossal melting and convection of material around the impact site and deep into the lunar interior. The authors claim this then induced thermochemical instabilities that drove the dense potassium rare earth elements and phosphorus, collectively known as creep, towards the Moon's near side, inducing the lunar geochemical asymmetry we see today. Of course, it's only an idea, and there will be many more. This is space time. Still to come, Beijing's space station to be completed this year, and Japan launches a new hybrid telecommunications satellite into orbit. All that and more still to come on space time. Beijing says it will complete construction of its Tiangong, or Heavenly Palace Space Station, this year. The Tianhe, or Harmony of the Heavens core module of the orbiting outpost, was launched into a 340km high orbit in April last year, with two more modules planned. Once completed, the Tiangong will have a mass of between 80 and 100 tonnes, roughly a fifth the mass of the International Space Station, and about two-thirds the size of the old Russian Mir Space Station. China is planning more than 40 orbital launches during the year, including at least six missions to their new space station. These will include at least two Shenzhou manned missions and two Tianzhou cargo flights, as well as the space station's two additional modules, Mengtian and Wentian. The Tianhe core module provides life support communications and living quarters for three crew members, it includes a galley and toilet, as well as housing, the guidance, navigation, orbital orientation and propulsion systems and controls, a service section and a docking hub. 
The first of the two science laboratory modules, the Wengtian, is slated for launch in May, followed by its near-identical twin, the Mengtian, in August. The current six-month Shenzhou-13 mission aboard the Tianhe core module is China's longest manned space flight since they put their first humans into space back in 2003, becoming only the third nation after Russia and the United States to achieve manned space flight. The Shenzhou-13 crew have already conducted several spacewalks and they've carried out tests using the space station's robotic arm, which successfully latched onto the Tianzhou-2 cargo ship, undocking it, and then redocking the vehicle. This is space time. Still to come, a new study confirms that the past seven years have been the seven hottest on record. All that and more still to come on space time. The largest and most sophisticated commercial telecommunications satellite ever launched by Japan, the Imarsat 6F1, has blasted into orbit aboard an H-2A rocket from the Tanegashima Space Center 40 kilometers south of Kyushu. The Imarsat 6F1 was delivered by air from Toulouse, France, and then to Tanegashima Space Center. Following the arrival at the Space Center, the functions of the satellite were checked and tested. It was then fitted to the payload attach fitting and encased within the payload fairing. Finally, the fairing was transported into the Vehicle Assembly Building VAB, and installed on the H-2A launch vehicle. After completing the final launch preparations in the Vehicle Assembly Building early this morning, H-2A flight number 45 was moved to the launch pad approximately 480 meters away and the vehicle's fuel loading and final check were performed at the launch pad. H2A is currently preparing for the countdown. Automatic countdown sequence has been initiated. All systems are go. Activating the camera batteries. It's a deviating off. We have a liftoff of the H2 launch vehicle number 45 from the Jaxa Tanegashima Space Center at 12.32.00 a.m. This Japan Standard Time. Following the liftoff, the operation control of the launch vehicle has been switched from the blockhouse to the range control center. The 5,470-kg satellite was built by Airbus Defense and Space using a Eurostar 3000 EOR bus. The spacecraft is fitted with both L and KA band antennas and uses an electric propulsion system. The L band payload supports a very low cost mobile communications network, while the KA band payload augments existing satellite telecommunications and high speed broadband networks. The MRSAT 6F1 will be supported from a ground station in Western Australia. The launch is the first of seven planned for MRSAT by 2024. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. The European Union's Climate Monitoring Service is reporting that the past seven years have been the hottest on record globally by a clear margin. The findings by the Copernicus Climate Change Service confirm that 2021 joined an unbroken warm streak going back to 2015. It found that last year was the fifth warmest on record globally, based on data going back to the mid-1800s. The annual average temperature last year was between 1.1 and 1.2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, as measured between 1850 and 1900. And that increase in temperature comes despite the cooling effect of the La Nina weather pattern which we're now going through. Global average atmospheric carbon dioxide levels are now already well above 416 parts per million. But the new figures also show a sharp increase in record concentrations of atmospheric methane, now at 1,876 parts per billion. That's more than double the average annual growth rate seen over the previous 17 years. It means that increases in both planet warming greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane are showing no signs of slowing down. 
Meanwhile, new data from NASA and the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration has confirmed that melting ice and expanding water due to heat has seen global average sea levels increase by 3.4 millimetres per year since 1993. Now, based on current trends, the 1.5% temperature increase sought under the Paris Agreement is simply unachievable, with 2.7% now looking far more likely. Scientists have uncovered the largest ichthyosaur ever found in the United Kingdom. Ichthyosaurs look like reptilian versions of dolphins. The 10-metre-long fossilised skeleton dates back some 180 million years. The unprecedented discovery was made on the floor of a drained lake bed in the Midlands town of Rutland. Researchers from the Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust are carrying out the excavation. A new study shows that consuming at least half a teaspoon of olive oil a day has been linked to a lower risk of dying over a 28-year period. The study, reported in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, looked at some 90,000 people finding that those with the highest intake of olive oil had the lowest risk of dying from cardiovascular disease, cancer, neurodegenerative disease or respiratory disease. It seems replacing 10 grams per day of margarine, butter, mayonnaise and dairy fat with the equivalent amount of olive oil was also linked to a lower risk of dying. However, substituting olive oil for other vegetable oils such as canola, corn, safflower and soybean did not reduce the risk. And so a linked editorial suggests that vegetable oils may produce the same health benefits as olive oil. Well, we got a bit of a sneak preview last week. Now let's again join technology editor Alex Zaharov Reut from ITY.com as he wraps up the world's largest consumer electronics show, CES 2022 in Las Vegas. The first thing you noticed was that there were a lot of gaps on the show floor here and there. Obviously, there were not as many attendees. In 2020, the last time it was on in full, there were 4,400 exhibitors. This time, there was 2,300. Back then, in 2020, there were 171,000 attendees, and this time, there were 40,000. So you definitely could see that there was a lot fewer people and you know, they had spaced out the stands. But even so, there was still the Eureka Park section, which is with all the startups and all the delegations from Italy and the UK and Korea and France and the US and all, all sorts of other places to do with startups. I mean, it was packed. Look, obviously, you had the BMW color-changing car. Now, interestingly, that is changing from black to white. You get to see How the interior of it? the car. They've wrapped the car in effectively e-ink paper. So it's not paint. It's the same sort of e-ink you'll find in a Kindle reader, for example, but obviously designed to sit on the outside of the car and to be able to take the punishment that heat will give. Now, BMW gave some examples of where this could be useful in that uh, you would have it black in uh, winter or at nighttime when it's cold and you would have it white in summer. But you could have different patterns, but just like in the age of black and white TV, I mean, eventually they'll figure out how to do that in colour and you'll be able to have whatever colour scheme you want. There are prismatic paints which you can buy for your car, which will make it look one colour from one angle and another colour from a different angle. But that's based on the physical properties of the molecules in the paint itself. This is different. Yeah, well, it's e-ink. It's effectively e-ink of the same sort that you have with your Kindle reader. And, you know, one of the things I saw from TCL, which is the company that makes televisions and smartphones, they, and also last year they had the TCL Next Wear, which is a pair of glasses you put on that uh, you plug into your phone with USB-C. They had uh, their uh, TCL Next Vision tablet. Now, this tablet, originally when they showed it last year, it didn't have a backlight because the idea was it would use the reflected light from the environment you were in and it will be very friendly to your eyes. Now, they've worked on that through all of last year, and they have included a backlight because it just was too fiddly not to have a backlight in there. But the screen itself looks like a full-color e-ink screen, so you don't have that glare of the LED backlight shining in your eyes. It looks different, but it's the full resolution. You know, it's, it's the same sort of display, but it's, it's more matte rather than glossy. And so I imagine that uh, you know, the next version of the car colours will, will have this sort of more matte-looking colour display because the technology does exist. But when they'll have it so that you can have this bright cherry red that looks really glossy 
well, that's, some, that's something else. But, I mean, also you saw with mobile phones, Huawei and others have launched mobile phones with that same sort of prismatic kind of paint color where you could look at it and as you move it around, the colors do change, but you have no control effectively over that. Whereas with the BMW, you have full control, and in theory, you could program logos to appear. I mean, the uh, graphical touches as it changed from one color to the other were very detailed. So that's an exciting thing. Now, other things that we saw there, I mean, I did see the version 2 of the TCL Nextwear Air. It's about 30% lighter. The front of it looks more like a pair of Ray-Ban glasses. You could have one that was see-through that you could actually see the world behind the projected image of the phone or laptop you're looking at. You can have up to a 140-inch screen from about four feet away. And um, you could easily take off the glasses. One was a blackout, so more sort of for VR effect. The other one was see-through, but they, from the front, they look more like regular glasses. They don't look like this giant headset, which, you know, the reason those sort of headsets have never, t- never taken off is because they look ridiculous. But these ones, you could easily wear them on a bus, and most people would just think you've got a pair of sunglasses on, whereas instead you're really looking at your phone or you're plugged into your laptop or whatever. And these are out now, or are they uh, still in no, the No, they're coming later this year. I mean, the, the original ones were out, and uh, what they're trying to do with the second version is what they did with the first one, which was to bundle. In Australia, they bundle, I think, six months of Optus Sport. So they're trying to recreate that kind of deal because it, it helps to sell it. I mean, the original pair was $899. So it's not a cheap purchase, but it's not ridiculously expensive either. And they also had the AR glasses, which were more in the concept stage. I saw the video in a pre-CES briefing where they were sort of imagining how these AR glasses work. And it's sort of how you'd imagine uh, Apple AR glasses might work. But the trick, of course, is that these need to be wireless, they need to have batteries, they need to have a processor, they need to have 5G and 4G and 3G, and they need to not weigh a ton and not cost... um, thousands and thousands of dollars. I mean, another thing that uh, TCL had there was a foldable, bendable mobile phone called the Chicago, or codenamed Chicago, which looked very much like the Samsung Galaxy Flip 3. And whilst it still had a crease in the middle of the screen, like the Galaxy uh, Z Flip 3, the crease was much less noticeable. It was still there, but much less noticeable. And the reason they haven't decided to launch it is because they want to get the price down to about six to $700 US which would be around about $1,000 Australian, which would be about two-thirds of the price of the Samsung Galaxy Z Flip 3. So they've been able to prove they can do it, but it's just a case of wanting, them wanting to get the price down. And because uh, TCL actually makes their own displays, it's something that they're working on very hard to do. Now, there was also Asus that had a 17-inch laptop uh, which actually was able to fold into about the size of an A4 sheet of paper and it had a separate keyboard. So it's this 17-inch beautiful display that you can fold in half and you could either have it as a big display or you could have it so that one half, it's in laptop configuration, but the second, the lower part would be either a virtual keyboard or, you know, would just be in that particular configuration. And uh, so we're going to see lots more folding displays over the course of this year. Uh, I also saw a gadget called a Vira Warn. Now, this was a little, it's about the size of one of those little small fan heaters that you can buy for about 20 bucks from Coles or Woolies when it's winter time. And this particular unit can detect COVID in the air. But they, more interesting, more um, applicable to the world, really, was a gadget that it looks a bit like an oxygen mask that you put over your face, over your mouth and nose, and it has a handle. And it's about two to $300 US. And you can just breathe into it, and it can instantly tell you whether you or not you have COVID. And it has a little $39 US cartridge that's good for 200 uses. So it will make the rapid antigen test obsolete. Um, they have to actually... When's you know, that coming it. out? We all want that. Well, later, later this year, later this year. And it'll be uh, clearly, you know, it'll be a, a, a great hit because... Instantly, you can tell whether you've got COVID or not. You don't have to wait 15 minutes and you can use it for 200 times. So I guess it depends how um, reliable it is, but too, how sensitive yeah, it is. Yeah, they obviously say that it's amazing. And look, I, I will have the video of that up. If you type ITWIRE CES VIRA WARN, V I R A W A R N, you can watch the video interview that I did with one of the VIRA WARN representatives talking about their um, freestanding. COVID detection gadgets and the one that you can put on your face. Uh, I saw different applications of wireless power. These are the companies that uh, we heard about in the last decade that were able to send power over the air to charge your phone. And although that is something that will come later this decade, the initial applications are... That was to be Tesla's able to send... dream, wasn't it, Nikola Tesla? Well, it was. Yeah. And already we saw Motorola slash Lenovo, which is now the same company, at least for the mobile phone side of things, Motorola, the company that makes all the... Uh, 
radios for police and for uh, first responders, that side of the company is still separate, called Motorola. But um, Lenovo Motorola showed off, and as did Xiaomi, a, uh, a, the ability to, to transmit power over the air to charge your phone, but it was very slow. And if you walked in front of it or put something in front of it, the power would stop. But the applications for wireless power are that you can, for example, on your shelf at the supermarket, you can have a little display. It's got no battery inside whatsoever. It's receiving power from what looks like a little Wi-Fi terminal sitting on the wall, and it is able to power these devices, which can then update prices in real time, do instant stock takes. Uh, you can also have a little RFID-style tag, except with this technology inside that can tell you um, where the items are in a store, instant stock takes again. If someone's taken some clothes into a, a change room, you know which items they have, how many of them they have. And if you walk out the door, uh, and you're a member of theirs that can just charge you automatically. So they were showing me the chipsets. And so there's one company called Ossia, another company called Energis. And I'll have the uh, video interviews with the representatives from those companies up that people can see. Uh, but look, there was, there was lots of cool stuff there. I mean, another gadget was a telescope from a French company that was on Kickstarter. They had a, a previous model, but they've got a new model that's smaller. It's controlled by your phone. It's got a 50 times zoom. So the whole idea is you can take photographs and it can track the sky or the planet as it's moving. And you can get these close-ups of Nebula and or Saturn or the Moon or Jupiter. And uh, you know, it was really cool. It's battery-powered. Um, obviously, you can leave your mind. You've got a little stand and this telescope is connected to an app on your phone. And it's just tracking whatever it is in the night sky you want to track. So that's just the tiniest bit. I, I took dozens and dozens of videos. We just have IT wire. CES 2022 into Google, you'll find all the different videos. A lot of the journalists, there was only four Australian journalists there, and a lot of the US journalists didn't turn up. And so a lot of the journalists were just covering press releases. I took a sort of more serendipitous path through CES. I mean, there was way too much to see. If I had a hundred of myself with a um, hundred uh, you know, iPhones and a hundred Rode microphones, because I was using Rode microphones, I probably still couldn't have covered the whole thing because there was just so much there. But another great thing that wasn't at CES that I took with me was my Rode microphones. I had lapel mic clipped onto me. I had another wireless Rode microphone inside of their handheld microphone attachment. And I was attachment. speaking to you through a Rode microphone. Right yeah, now. yeah. And, and you know, through it's very a Rode noisy panel as well. Well, yeah. I mean, they're a great company. And the the head, my headphones are Sennheiser, but... Well, I've got the Rode microphone that plugs in the side of my iPhone, and that's a shotgun directional mic. So that was perfect for when I was uh, filming people giving presentations on screen. But uh, without the Rode microphone, I mean, previously I'd use the iPhone to record everything. It used to be quite directional itself. But now the iPhone can sort of record 360-degree sound. So to really be able to hear yourself, and of course we were all speaking through masks as well. Everyone was masked up. It really made a big difference to have these Rode microphones there that were connected to my iPhone through the little wireless go-to adapter that plugs in via lightning into the side of the iPhone and, and it, it merged the um, audio recordings from two separate mics into the one video. So that was uh, hugely beneficial. Is there a lot of technology in PPE these days, especially with COVID? Sure, look, the only thing that I saw besides the viral warn, which helps to detect whether you've got COVID or not, was the uh, Razer Pro. So R Razer, the gaming company, uh, made a mask last year that has a see-through panel and they had these two fans uh, and with filters, so one for breathing in, one for breathing out. Of course, Razer does all of this RGB colour schemes and flashing colours, so you could have the, the ring of RGB colour. They launched a new version called the Razer Pro, um, which won't come out till later this year, but Originally, Razer was claiming that the filtration was N95 class, and uh, it turns out that it's not N95 class. So um, that was a bit of a disappointment in that uh, you know people are expecting a certain level. That's actually quite bad. That's that's not just a disappointment. That's well, that's bad. And and they had to remove the fact that they claimed it was N95. But life went on. I mean, I guess in Vegas, you know, a lot of gamblers are already taking a risk. What's one more? So well, I look forward to. Uh, <laughs> CES 2023, and uh, I think, you know, barring any more crazy variants of, uh, you know... Well, they're running out of Greek letters, so, you know... That's right, yeah. <laughs> well, I might have to start again. That's Alex Saharov-Royd from ity.com. That's the show for now. 
Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more Space Time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Space Time YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. And Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 